I, I am going to just sort of set the stage here. So uh, Dr. John Kedis is an um, associate professor at the Department of Diabetes and Cancer Discovery Science within the Arthur Riggs Diabetes and Met uh, Metabolism Research Institute at City of Hope in Duarte, Southern California. And for 15 years at City of Hope, Dr. Cadiz has delved into the complex mechanisms of type 1 diabetes, devising scientific resources for team-based research initiatives. The data systems, analysis tools, and websites created for collaborations have been used by researchers all over the world. He's at the net center of this nexus of data, um, which is currently evolving. And he, see, he serves as, the prince, as a principal investigator and co-investigator on several projects funded by NIH and the JDRF. And uh, so welcome and thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to talk with us. And Dr. Alex Banks, um, he is uh, an assistant professor of medicine um, at uh, Harvard Medical School in 2018. The Banks Lab moved to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School in the Division of Endocrinology from the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. He's the director of the Energy Balance Core Facility, which me measures metabolic rates in laboratory animals. And investigations at the Banks Lab focus on understanding the mechanisms linking obesity with insulin resistance. The goal of this work is to provide new insights that may lead to novel therapeutic interventions. Approaches used in their work include pharmacologic and genetic approaches in mice and human cells to mechanistically model aspects of metabolic disease, human metabolic disease. So thank you both very much. And um, I don't, uh, I, I, it looks like um, Dr. Cadiz is gonna start off. So yes, take it away. Thanks, thank you so much, Monica, for the, for the introduction and um, welcome. Um, I think the goal of to my talk, I hope um, it will be helpful, is to orient you to some resources available in the Human Islet Research Network and tell you a, a little bit about this. Um, the first thing I can tell you is right on the opening slide is that this is an NIH funded initiative. And actually the initiative began in 2014. So it's going on its eighth year now. And what NIH wanted to do was create a modular network of themes that can come in and out of a, a, a pretty large initiative called the Human Islet Research Network. And so what they did was assemble um, really some of the world's leading uh, scientists in type one diabetes and organized it by theme. And I won't read the themes to you here, but, but each of these circles around here represent a different foci for this network. And this network all works together to try to address a couple of major challenges in type one diabetes. For myself, I'm part of the uh, coordinating center called HIRIC, the Human Islet Research in Enhancement Center. But in all, we, we've got um, a lot of participation around the world, 200 plus investigators, many institutions, and even in several countries. So with, just, with that background, let me just jump right in and tell you a little bit more about resources that, that might be relevant to you. You can, of course, go on the website, and this is the reason why I won't spend too much time talking about HERN, is because you can find out about different funding opportunities we have. If you're interested in the research, information is there. You want to know about the networks, the papers republished, et cetera. But what I want to bring to your attention today is one of the tabs there called resources. And so I'm going to highlight that for you today in the, in the talk. Now, what I, what I will spend time on um, somewhat is what we call the Hearn resource browser. And essentially what that is, is that we catalog and try to promote the different tools that are being generated in the Hearn. And I'll show you what, what those tools are in a minute. And so that is part of the, of the D challenge. Now, like many of the different resources that, that I will point out to you here, we have webinars about the, the resource browser already, so I don't have to spend a lot of time here because there are some good um, videos that will serve as orientation to you in, in greater detail than what, than what I will give you today. But another um, resource, which if you have been attending this webinar series, you'll know about is something called the PancDB or Pancreas Database. And it's a portal 
of deeply phenotyped human pancreatic data. So you've got single cell RNA-seq, a tax-seq, aminophenotyping um, data, and the list goes on. There's a, there's a matrix there of different data that's available to you on 127 uh, pancreata. Now, we don't have to talk uh, about that. That is part of the HERN network, but actually on the Sugar Sciences website, there is a 15-minute uh, uh, video about it. And then also, I believe that uh, um, Golnez Vaidehi has already given a, uh, a seminar about this to the community. So I think most people on this call may be already familiar with this particular resource. What you may not be familiar with is another resource. It's not part of HERN, but it does also support HERN, and it is a place to go to look for data. So I wanted to bring that up to you. It's called the Integrated Islet Distribution Program. And what this program does is it largely supplies control pancreata, but some type two, and on rare occasion, type one pancreata. But what, it, what it's actually supplying is it's human islets, human islets to different laboratories. And over the course of almost 20 years, um, there has amassed a great deal of data on these donors as well, data that can be made available to you for various analysis. And you can get a window of what kind of data that is. If you go on the IIDP's website, there's a page, it's public. You can kind of get a feel for what you might expect if you want to apply for access to that data. Next, there is the Network for Pancreatic Organ Donors with Diabetes program. I've been fortunate to be a part of this uh, program as well, but I think the next series of talks, so not today's talks, but uh, the, the next ones, if that's next week or sometime in the near future, you will actually be hearing about a repository of data from NPOD. And so what NPOD does is unlike the IIDP, which I just told you about, NPOD is providing tissues, tissues from the human pancreas, sometimes tissues from the spleen, the duodenum, um, various tissues that come along with the pancreas, but that's the main that's the main objective of NPOD. And there is a lot of deep data as well too that's available there. So it's a very nice resource. And again, um, probably something that most of you will know about or should know about. Next is the Pancreas Atlas. And this is a growing repository of pancreas images. Um, and it, what it's doing is it's taking data from NPOD, data from IIDP, data from PancDB, and it is giving you really beautiful image data on that. And I believe that has also been addressed, and there are um, recordings of the Pancreas Atlas and a lot of these other ones, not only on our HERN website, which you can find on the main page, but, uh, or through the main page, I should say, but I believe Sugar Science and DKNet, in fact, have taken some, uh, some efforts to try and um, make these available to you as well. Okay, so what is this resource browser and what essentially are we doing? Um, it's a pretty diverse database. It's gonna have anything from antibodies, antibodies used in, in type one diabetes research to different cell lines and models, different constructs, different mice models. Um, but what I suspect is probably of interest here is the data sets and I'll talk about that. Uh, but we also highlight special collections, collections that have been tested by other scientists that may be relevant to you. And again, I'll point out that if you are interested in any of this information, you can uh, sign up for a newsletter. And I believe it's every quarter, every month, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting now, but we frequently send out newsletters and we are updating uh, anyone who's subscribed to the newsletter about what is happening in Hearn. And there's also job opportunities, postdoc opportunities and other staff opportunities, faculty opportunities that are always coming up and, and always seem to be in need from different labs in, in the network. So that, that's another resource. Okay, so uh, a question, you might come here and you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm looking at mouse data, okay? So maybe that's something that, that you're interested in and you wanna find out what, what we have. Well, you'd click on, on those data sets, you'd come up with, with a search, 
we've tried to make it somewhat intuitive. So hope, hope that that is. Then on the left-hand side, you can uh, click out, uh, click, I should say, for mouse or um, any alternative names that people reference their mice data with, and then you'll get, you'll get some results that, that will come about. Then when you click on any of those results, you'll get a little bit deeper into the record, which will then link you to the actual source data where, where that data is located and housed. And here it's, in this case, it's in the uh, GEO, the Gene Expression Omnibus database. So you'll have direct access to that. But this is the Human Islet Research Network. Um, and so besides highlighting where the article is and where you can get that data, you might want to ask the question about how do I get and how do I export this data, right? So whether we're talking about mice or, or human data, here there is if you here there is a way to do it if you are familiar with APIs and know how APIs work, you can use our APIs to generate, a CSV-like file and then pull all these data sets so that you can have it all for you in one spot. If you don't know how to do that, these kinds of queries um, are not yet available on the website, but if you just send me, if you just send me an email, I'll be happy to give you the, the file. You push a button, you run it, and you'll get this data um, generated for you. So as I was saying, it's, it, it really is not only mouse data, but if you were looking, for example, for RNA-seq data sets for humans, because you want to use it in your, in your D challenge, you can do that. This, is, um, this slide is, I think, maybe like a month or two old. We've had some uh, increases in the number of data sets here. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to aggregate these relevant data sets. So hopefully, you're not searching through the literature and worried about whether or not I've collected everything. This is at least with respect to the HERN, um, hopefully a comprehensive of enough um, uh, database for you that you can access these resources. But that's not the only thing that we have available in here. And I know that some of you may also be doing uh, research in your labs. So I just wanted to, to point out that you can actually ask different questions, you know, for, for example, at least for type one diabetes, it seems to be that many of us are looking for antibodies that target insulin. And that can be tricky because there are things that are, you know, proposed to work, don't actually work. It ends up being problematic. You waste a lot of time. So what can, what's in the community that people have used and tested? So in order to ask that question, again, do something similar. Uh, click on the um, antibodies, select what your targets are. You want a polyclonal, you want it to target insulin. You get a series of um, results. You can pick uh, which one of those results. And here, um, you can ask a different question. And that is, um, do I, should I waste my time on this? Um, is this antibody any good? And so we highlight for you who has used this antibody by this function here where, where we allow people to rate the resource. And you can see, in fact, that this particular resource has been um, tested by a, by a lab, Chris Wright's lab at, at Vanderbilt University. They gave um, a little bit of feedback, but what they also did is that if you clicked on this section, you could actually get the data as well. And so you could see how it stained and how well it worked. So that would give you some idea of the efficiency of that, that particular antibody. And so that is one way to, um, another way to query the data. But, but what if you say, oh, no, I, I, I don't want a guinea pig antibody. Instead, I, I want a, a rabbit monoclonal, okay? So then you would try to revisit that and return, and you can you know, search any number of ways there. And if you typed it in, and you looked, and you, you would do that, and if you didn't get the result that you were expecting, what would happen is that we would direct you to the DKNet, and I'll show you that in, in a minute as well. But um, another thing I wanted to point out to you is that what we do is we also, so if you want to get an idea of the latest resources, whether those are data sets, tissue blocks, et cetera, when you scroll further down on the resource browser site, you'll see some of the latest entries in the, in the repository. We've since updated it. I think we have 2,200 
uh, resources now. So, so that, that's available for you as well. And finally, I'll just uh, ask um, a, a third question here. What if you're looking at mice? Mice are um, uh, pretty popular to use in the lab. You click on it, you ask, hey, I'm, I'm interested in finding a mice that works for my gene of interest. You try here, you can find different mice, but if you can't, and this is what I was referring to earlier, we will direct you to DKNet's website. And so uh, if you have been on these calls before, I would suspect that you've probably heard a talk by Dr. Jeff Greith or, or uh, Kowei, and they've shown you the extensive repository that they have almost nearing a billion different resources, not only in, um, in our community, but different diabetes communities. So they have a very nice collection in which you can access data. And that's in fact why we've partnered with DKNet to help us gather the minimum amount of information, deposit um, uh, data, try to figure out who's citing what paper, where, all those things are helpful so that you can get uh, a better idea of what is available and, and who's using that. So um, like, I've, like I've said, we've got a lot of different repositories uh, available to you in Hearn. I didn't spend a lot of time here today going over those because there's a lot of videos already that, that are out there. There are videos on our website. There are videos on the Sugar Sciences website. There already have been um, talks to go into um, sufficient detail about how to use those resources. There are upcoming talks on, on how to do this. I was just hoping to, to convey to you a, a, a basic overview of a, a browser in which you can curate the different resources that are available in Hearn. And if you're curious about what's going on in type 1 diabetes, this is a good place uh, to do it. And, and also to tell you that this is not a closed network. It's open to anyone who wants to, um, who wants to use any of these resources. Um, there are some options available to you if you want to follow what's going on. You can um, contact us through any of these channels. You can also contact us directly. Sandy Bashir is our scientific data curator. So she's the one putting in the resources into the resource browser. And Layla Rouse is the person that makes sure that any email that comes to us is not forgotten. And it looks like I've made a mistake there. Um, I did not put her proper uh, email address. I'm sorry. Her email address is L. Rouse, just take the first letter and her last name, but you can email her as well if you have any questions for her or for me. She is the, the best person to contact and we'll make sure that these, all your questions um, will get answered. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, that was a really excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, you know, offering your team um, to kind of field any other outstanding questions. It's really generous of you guys to give all your you've got going. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, Alex, do you want to start? Yes, you see my screen? Yes, I do. Perfect. Okay. So, um, you know, that was so impressive, John, and the resources that you have, and also how well they're coordinated, how you can search all these various databases, how you can look at these data sets, you can look at slides, is really impressive. And <clears throat> it's a little bit, um, awe-inspiring considering how far we are behind with indirect calorimetry, body weight regulation data in, uh, in mice and in humans. So we're probably, you know, six or seven years behind where you are because we're just starting to standardize the data. Um, the point of this talk is to talk about the data that comes out, how we can measure body weight regulation, and now um, continuous glucose monitoring in mice a little bit. Um, and how that can relate to body weight regulation, glucose homeostasis, insulin resistance, and diabetes. How we take the data, how we collect the data, how we uh, process the data for statistical analysis, and then at the very end, a little bit about trying to make something like John has, where we have a database where we can think about putting all of this data together for analysis and to make a resource for investigators all over the world. So, um, so let me just begin. Okay, so. Why are we thinking about obesity and energy balance in the context of type 1 diabetes? So there's uh, some study which was done more than 20 years ago showing the relative weight of 
um, boys with type 1 diabetes versus uh, normal um, non-diabetic boys. And you can see an increased uh, body weight as well as an elevated uh, height in over 500 subjects. And uh, similar trends were true with the girls, uh, non-diabetic versus diabetic girls um, with a height as well as weight. And it just, um, this has been replicated by a few other studies. Not all studies have found increased height and weight in individuals with type 1 diabetes, uh, pediatric um, patients, but enough of them to really think about energy balance, food intake, energy expenditure in the context of type 1 diabetes. And so the preclinical work uh, hasn't really caught up with these kinds of observations, and maybe it's time to change that. Alex, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, oh, here it yeah, is. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Is this is this a re is the is the time frame of this recent versus? I, I can see that you're probably going to answer this next. So, like in 1960, was this happening for, within type one diabetics? I think this is coming up on the next slide. Yeah. So the data in type one diabetics really hadn't been collected that well, or I I haven't found the literature going back much further than this, because um, obesity was not considered that um, prevalent in the 1960s. So that's where we were going with this, where yeah. you know, the, the rates of obesity have been going up over time. They were steady until around 1980. You can see overweight's been pretty constant, but the rate of obesity um, has gone up since 1980 to mm. the present time and continues to go up. And so I think it was in this era, so that study that I showed you was done in 2000 when obesity was, you know, it, it kept going up and people were wondering how far up is it going to go was when people started to look at this. Um, if you look in the context of type 1 diabetes 100 years ago, where there was this incredible leanness, there was this wasting syndrome before there was insulin, maybe obesity you know, isn't that bad, but obviously it's not that good either. So I think it's just something we need to think about. Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I've heard from other you know, parents on other sites, this the idea that uh, on a pump, um, you know, the advice is sort of just eat what you want and bowl is for it versus historically there were different dietary, you know, directions, uh, directives. So I, I just wondered if, if you had captured any of that, those data. It's kind of interesting. It, it is interesting data. And, and I think, um, you know, the guide there is really to keep the glucose within range more than controlling for, uh, for food intake and, and energy expenditure. Um, and uh, an energy balance. So I think really the consideration is more about glycemia, um, but we can do things in, in preclinical models. I mean, maybe it's just the anabolic effects of insulin. Maybe you mm -hmm. eat, you have insulin, you gain weight, and it's better than the alternative of being hypoglycemic if you don't have enough insulin and having these, these crashes. So I, I think- right. um, Yeah, some... it's a very complex question. I can't wait to hear more. Thank you yeah. for taking that question. Okay, so when we think about energy balance, it should be very simple, right? So energy balance should just be the food in minus energy out. And it's relatively easy to quantitate food intake in mice. Um, mice, you can put them in a cage and, uh, and you just monitor how much they eat. And the food has exactly the same energy content day in and day out. They're not changing their meals or their macronutrients. Um, and so you can measure their food intake and their energy expenditure is measured in these indirect calorimeters where the mouse, you monitor the air coming out of the cage, you measure how much carbon dioxide they're producing, how much oxygen they've consumed, and you use a computer to estimate the rates of energy expenditure. So energy in minus energy out in the form of energy expenditure, and any of the uh, food which is not fully digested comes out and you can do fecal bomb calorimetry to fully balance the equation. So this is not new. These studies have been going on for over you know, 200 years. Um, Lavoisier uh, was able to measure oxygen consumption in both uh, animals as well as people. This is um, Antoine Lavoisier, and he's measuring the oxygen consumption rate of a subject. And you can see it's being captured in this ball. It gets desiccated, and then he, he measures it. And uh, his wife and, and lab partner uh, was here taking notes, and she actually uh, drew this, um, this picture. So what was figured out about 100 years ago was that you can estimate the rates of energy expenditure using the oxygen consumption rates and carbon dioxide rates. Now, these are just an estimate, um, but they found it to be 
pretty reliable and really haven't been dramatically improved upon since the 1950s. So we're still using this Weir equation from the 1950s to use these experimental measures of oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, and to estimate energy expenditure. And we do that to this day, which is kind of neat. So how do you do that today? So in people, you might be familiar with VO2 max, uh, endurance exercise, or uh, sprinting. You can do this as a cycle ergometer where you can measure <clears throat> maximum metabolic rate by measuring oxygen consumption acutely. There are these um, indirect calorimetry rooms, and there was this interesting article by uh, Julia here in Vox where she lived in this room for a few days and they measured her 24 hour energy expenditure, all the food that she ate and all her energy expenditure. And, and that's very similar to what we do with the mouse. And then for critically ill patients to estimate their caloric need, you can also determine their resting metabolic rate while they're in a hospital setting so that you know how much, um, how much food. So for a person, most of their energy expenditure, more than half usually, is resting energy expenditure. So that's just the sleeping metabolic rate, and then the daily activities of living just increases a tiny bit. Eating food, digesting food increases energy expenditure. This is um, activity any energy expenditure. So to have about a thousand kcals of energy expenditure is a tremendous amount of activity. This person would have to be exercising for four or five hours. And then in type one diabetic subjects that might also be losing energy in their urine, you might have even further energy expenditure because you're losing more energy just uh, through the urine in an uncontrolled type of diabetic. So in mice, um, we have all of these systems. You have you can array a whole bunch of mice and measure. You know we can do 24 mice simultaneously, collecting the data every one minute, <clears throat> and we measure their rates of exercise and their body weight, as well as um, their locomotor activity, food intake, water intake, all the stuff, oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide. So you get a ton of data, and very recently we've been able to uh, to get continuous glucose monitoring as well with this sort of thing, and we're standardizing the data and trying to put it into a database, into a repository to, to try to get close to that last lecture that we just heard. Okay, what do the data look like? So of all these measured parameters, oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, food intake, physical activity, wheel running, water intake, body weight, and body temperature, I'm just showing you one of them. And so this is eight mice in each of these groups, two groups measuring all these parameters, and we're measuring data here I believe it's every five minutes and over just six hours, we have uh, over 1900 data points. So there's a lot of data coming out and, and it's almost too much data to handle, right? So in one day, you're talking about 61,000 data points and that's just for one day. So here's what it looks like over two days. And this is if you average each of the mice in each of the groups into one point. So this is just one point per group per five minute period. So there's a lot of data. So what we're talking about is a tool to help you manage the data for indirect calorimetry experiments like this um, and to, to analyze it and figure out what it means. So uh, before this tool that we made, um, I used to do this in Microsoft Excel. It would take me about eight hours. I do not recommend it. It's not fun. Uh, it's not reproducible and uh, it's not standardized. It's an ad hoc analysis. You just you know, you do whatever you think is right, and there's really no record of what you've done in Excel. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just said, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not great. Um, I, I, we wrote this program, CalR, so I never have to do this again, frankly. Um, so we wrote this program called CalR, which takes this raw data from the indirect calorimeter, and you get these spreadsheets that come out of it, which are for each animal, they go down maybe 10,000 or 20,000 rows. We have one that we're analyzing in the lab now, which is 723,000 rows. It's really, it's too much to handle without an automated uh, pipeline. So CalR helps to visualize, it loads in the data, it visualizes it, it allows you to do analysis. Um, this is uh, energy expenditure versus body mass, we'll talk about that. And it lets you do statistical analysis like ANOVA and ANCOVA to figure out, are these groups significantly different or not? And it provides a standardized pipeline, which gives you quality control, visualization, and um, and it allows you to also share your data in a reproducible manner. So I just want to give a couple examples of what we're talking about and why we should care. So here's one example. This is, I believe it's 12 mice per group, and this is their energy expenditure over time. And you can see each 
dark is uh, dark bar is 12 hours and each light is another 12 hours. And you can see uh, energy expenditure for these mice at 30 degrees is relatively low. It goes up when the mice wake up at, at nighttime, and then it goes down when the mice are asleep during the day. And that's that's all well and good. If you decrease the temperature to 23 degrees, so you make it colder for the mice, they generate enough heat. They increase their metabolic rate. And you can see at night it goes up and they're going back down. And at the same time, their body mass, as they're burning more and more energy, their energy expenditure goes up. You can see their body weight is going down relative to where they started until you go all the way down to like cold room and refrigerator type temperatures of four degrees. Now, mice in Boston here every winter do this and they survive and they still come into my house and then they leave my house. So this is what mice normally do. Uh, they increase their metabolic rate from where it was down here up about three to four fold. And they have a really high metabolic rate and they lose a lot of weight, but they're still at four degrees and then they start eating and they catch up. Mice are really remarkable in their metabolic flexibility. And we can capture all of this in the indirect calorimeter. Now, if you just want to see acutely what happens if you turn on all their brown fat, we can use a beta adrenergic agonist and you can take a bunch of mice, inject them, and you can see their metabolic rate go up from a low of about 50 in this group to about 150. So a threefold increase over the span of about one hour. So the metabolic flexibility is really cool. This is what indirect calorimetry can do. You can capture body weight, activity, metabolic rates, all of that good stuff. Here's another example. In this example, we have mice. We've given them thyroid hormone, so we're making them hyperthyroid. And you start out with 24 wild-type mice that are exactly the same. And then as you start injecting them with thyroid, you can see the metabolic rate go up and up and up. And so it looks like these mice getting T3, getting thyroid hormone, have this very high energy expenditure. And you can also see that they're increasing their food intake. So which actually wins out? Are they eating more or do they have a higher metabolic rate? What's happening to these mice? And so what you wanna be able to say is statistically, are these things significant? And so if you look at this baseline region and you compare the control versus hyperthyroid mice and you use an analysis of covariance, that is energy expenditure versus body mass, this is not significantly different when you start off. But after the end of the treatment, on the very last day, if you were to compare those animals, you have a very significant p-value for the analysis of covariance, meaning that the energy expenditure is significantly greater in these mice treated with thyroid hormone. They're hyperthyroid and hypermetabolic. But when you get back to this energy balance question, if you take the food intake in kcals minus the energy expenditure in kcals, you can see the mice that were hyperthyroid are in positive energy balance. That is, even though they have this really high metabolic rate, they're still eating even more than that. And so they're gaining weight. So this is a sort of analysis that you can do with CalR, which is energy balance, food intake, energy expenditure, and all of those things. Um, so very recently, we've been able to get mouse-sized wireless glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring. This surgery is really pretty invasive. The probe goes into the aortic arch. So you're actually not like a, a human, um, subcutaneous continuous blood glucose monitor, but this is actually central blood. So you're measuring um, arterial blood with this CGM. So you get very fast measurements. You get data recordings up to 10 times a second. We usually do just every minute because we monitor the mice for 40 days and you really don't want data every second for 40 days. It's just too much data. So we take averages every minute and you can see treating these mice uh, with glucose this is one mouse, and you can see the glucose spike up extremely rapidly, come back down almost as rapidly. You get this little shoulder and then um, a little peak over here. So we can now do continuous glucose monitoring mice. If you now combine indirect calorimetry and continuous glucose monitoring, you get some pretty cool results coming out, things that I'm not sure that we necessarily expected. So if you have a mouse, this is during the daytime and that's nighttime, and you're monitoring the blood glucose, it's extremely variable. Anyone who's monitored their own blood glucose or seen these kinds of data, see that it's really very noisy over time. The blood glucose is a little bit hard to interpret because of all the noise and the spikes. But when you put the food intake over top of this data, it starts to become a little bit more clear where you can see during this phase in the nighttime, food intake data is represented by the size and color of these dots over top of the glucose probe. 
So the glucose data, the glucose drops, and then the mouse starts eating, represented by these points, eating and eating and eating until they're actually slightly hyperglycemic. And then they stop eating and they, uh, they go back to sleep. And you can see during the nighttime as well, food intake is much higher. And you can see that also trends with higher glucose values as well. So starting to put continuous glucose data together with indirect calorimetry, we can get much um, more insight into the behavior and physiology of mice in diabetes and obesity. I'm just showing you one example of some, some recent data. This is um, from last week, where we took eight different mice fitted with these continuous glucose monitors, and we kept them in the indirect calorimeter. So if you look from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., blood glucose is really, these are young, healthy mice, and they're doing great. Their glycemia is very much under control. Here's a blow up between 120 and uh, 200 on this inlay plot, and their glucose is really steady. Body temperature is fixed. Energy expenditures within this tight window. RR is dropping a little bit because the mice are really, they're sleeping during this time. They're not eating very much and they're not moving very much. So low activity. We were doing a glucose tolerance test with this continuous glucose monitor to see what happens with the continuous glucose monitor. How does it look? And we found something really quite unexpected. When we started fasting these mice, we actually saw this spike in glucose. You can see it goes from about 130 up to about 160. So the mice, when we took the food away, had a little bit of a stress response. And instead of fasting, which we thought was going to drop their blood glucose, it actually raised their blood glucose. And you can see the nice glucose tolerance test spike here. But more than that, we saw compared to the same mice the day before, body temperature increased by more than two degrees, energy expenditure more than double um, or almost double. The resting uh, RAR, which is the ratio of energy utilization, so this is fatty acid oxidation down here, carbohydrate oxidation down here, drops as they're fasting. And you can see they run around a ton, especially compared to what they were doing the day before. So taking the continuous glucose monitoring data together with indirect calorimetry, you can see insights that you would have never expected to see, such as that taking food away gives you hyperglycemia, um, unlike what we were expecting, which was hypoglycemia. Okay, so CalR is a tool. Um, it has a graphical user interface. You load in the files that you get from these indirect calorimetry systems. Um, you just click, you can drag and drop your file right over top. Um, you have session files which record which animals are in which groups, but it's all point and click and it's made to be as easy as possible. You specify the time that the light cycle starts, usually 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Here it's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and then you can specify the energy content of the diet that the animals were eating. In this case, it's 3.5 kcals per gram. Then you specify which animals are in which groups, and you can go ahead and plot the data, which is going to look something like this. So you have animals in two different groups, and you can plot them over time and get something like this. You can select what time range you're interested in looking at. These are plotted by group, but you can plot the individual animals as well. So really within about five minutes of um, loading your data into CalR, you can get a pretty good sense of did your experiment work? Does it look unusual? Are you getting zero values or any of your cages empty or open? And you can start to go ahead with your data analysis. So the data that we get out of these cages gave us sort of a surprising finding. And if you go back and you read the literature, like from 1982, they shouldn't have been that surprising. So what we found and when you look at papers like this, it turns out that obese individuals and obese mice have higher metabolic rates than lean controls. And so here's a paper from Eric Ravison where he found that obese people had a higher metabolic rate than, um, than lean controls, which was not what they expected, but here's how they plotted it. So there's controls, moderately obese and more obese. And the more obese they were, the higher their metabolic rate. Well, what we found when we looked at over hundred mice was that bigger mice have higher metabolic rates too, and that oxygen consumption rates scale linearly with body mass. So larger animals have this higher metabolic rate, but that means if you really want to compare the metabolic rates of animals, you have to consider the body mass. You can't just take this mouse and that mouse and say, oh, this mouse has a higher metabolic rate, therefore it must have you know, a greater energy expenditure. It's all dependent on the context of body mass. These mice all have a normal metabolic rate for their body mass. And the question that you want to know is, has an intervention elevated the metabolic rate 
for the body mass or has a decreased the, the metabolic rate for that mass. So CalArc does all of this in the background. It's able to take the data. It takes the data for all of these different mass independent or mass dependent variables. If you have mass independent variables, it'll do an ANOVA. If they're mass dependent variables like oxygen consumption or carbon dioxide or food intake, it runs this analysis of covariance using mass as the, um, as the covariate. And then it even takes special cases into consideration when your lines are in parallel, which we don't have to get into because CalR does all of it in the background. So here's an example. You have two different experiments. It looks like in this one, the mice in red have a higher metabolic rate, rate than the group in black, and the ones in yellow have a higher metabolic rate than the ones in maroon. But really, you need to know the mass to know what happens here. And that's because if you look at the body mass of these two groups, you'd say, these groups are not significant by ANCOVA. These are bigger mice with a higher metabolic rate, but really they could be from exactly the same group. They're not higher for their metabolic rate. They have exactly the metabolic rate you'd expect for their mass. Whereas this group, this is actually the hyperthyroid experiment, you can see has a much higher metabolic rate, even at the exact same mass. So these are two very different interpretations of data that look very similar. So you just have to take body mass into consideration. And CalR does this for you when you load in your data. So how do we get there? We take all of this raw data, and this is what it looks like in CalR. This is the really raw data. These are the values for each animal every hour for about five days. We take each point and we average each point for each animal down to a single point, and then we plot it against body mass. And again, all of this happens in the background. When you get the analysis table in, in CalR, it looks a little bit confusing. You get these columns for mass dependent effects and group effects for full day, the light, which is when the mice are normally sleeping, and the dark when the mice are usually active. So the mass effect just says that bigger mice have a significantly higher, in, in this case, oxygen consumption than smaller mice. You have a mass effect. So big mice have a higher oxygen consumption than small mice, and that's true, that's significant. But what you really care about are, all, are the oxygen consumption rates different between the groups. And that's what CalArt helps to do. So when we do these experiments, and mass is such an important consideration, we usually measure the weight before the experiment, at the end of the experiment, and we just average it. Because sometimes mass can change in the beginning, throughout, or just change throughout. And so because we're taking the average metabolic rate for these analyses, we also take the average weight. And everything balances out. CalArt does a few other things that I want to talk about, one of which it cleans messy data. So here, here's a real world example that we saw. The data that was loaded in suggested that these mice at this one hour ate about 10 times the amount that they normally eat, or almost their entire daily food intake at this one point. And this is probably an error from the scale. And this we're sure is an error of the scale because this is negative food intake, which is impossible. You can't eat negative food. And so these are the data that, that were loaded into the program. CalR gives this error warning that says abnormal readings and gives you the option to click on this radio button to remove the outliers. And if it's more than three standard deviations from the group mean for that photo period, that is for the dark, you have the option of removing that. And you can see the data scales from six to minus four. And now the scale, nothing is zero. There's no negative food intake. And it goes, and this is sort of normal food intake for normal months. So just another word about the exclude outlier feature in CalR, because removing data is really fraught and you want to be sure that you're doing it properly. It only identifies values that are more than three standard deviations from the rest of the animals in that group in that interval. And all of the data remain in the original data file. Nothing is deleted. It's just excluded from the calculation and the analysis. And it disappears from the graph. But again, it's still there as a permanent record uh, for the graphs and for the analysis. And there's a special button where you can download any data that have been excluded. So you can see, oh, it says my 10 gram mouse ate 10 grams of food. Oh, okay, that sounds like it's appropriate. But you really should look at that data and make sure that your exclusions are appropriate. Um, just another thing that CalR does, and this gets to reproducibility and the ability to add your data to a database. So when you load in your raw calorimetry file, the body mass data that we discussed, you can take all of that and put that raw um, file into a database. And so this is a permanent record of the experiment. 
But then you have all this other metadata, like what the time range is, which metabolic parameter you're interested in, which animals are in which groups, also you know, colors and other things like that. And those all go into the session file, which is the metadata associated with each experiment. So if I were to send you, Monica, both the raw data and the session file, you could reproduce my experiment exactly. So the key points, CalR, this tool, it knows when to use mass dependent analyses or mass independent analyses. Um, it, used, it also knows, um, it doesn't know which body mass variable to use. So if you have lean body mass versus total body mass, really that's up to you to know um, what to do. CalR can't figure that out for you. For quality control, just make sure to look over your data and see if there's anything that looks out of place. You can add these um, data to a repository, which doesn't exist yet, but I would encourage you to share your data or deposit it into a data repository as it exists. And this is just a, a plug for something we're working on right now, um, much like you heard before about all these different databases, is a repository for indirect calorimetry data. So this is data from um, 30,000 mice here, and you can see in this repository, you'd be able to load data from your mice, put in the metadata, and see how your data would match with the existing ones out there. And when we do this, we sometimes find people have used units incorrectly, like kilocals instead of kilojoules, or they've divided by body weight instead of multiplying by body weight. And you can find things that you wouldn't normally see if you're not comparing it against what normal values are. So this can be very helpful for quality control, as well as for data reuse um, and the fair principles of data. So we're, we're working very hard on this right now. So uh, this is it. This is the summary. Um, what does CalR do? Um, so first of all, CalR, I may not have said it, it's Latin for the word heat, and it's written in the R programming language. Um, this is the usage of CalR. Um, we're in October already. We're at nearly 40,000 experiments analyzed, over 1,000 a month now. And the average session duration is about seven minutes and 26 seconds. So whereas it used to take me about eight hours in Excel, you can now do all of your analysis in about seven minutes, which is pretty good. That's Cal amazing. Art. That Go is ahead. an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes things much faster and easier. And I think that's why it's so popular. If it's going to save someone eight hours of their life, they're going to use this tool versus the old fashioned way. Yeah. So it's helping to standardize. Um, it makes these standardized data files. It makes everything much faster. We don't store any data. Uh, Google Analytics gets relative location data, so we know like what state you're in. Um, but it, it doesn't store any of the data or any personal identifiers. And it's a, just a basic tool. So there are experiments that CalR is not appropriate for analyzing, and we're working on making it more powerful. It can be found here at calrapp.org. And once again, it's free and open to the entire scientific community. And, uh, and that's it. So with that, um, I'll take any questions if there are any. So Alex, um, this, this body mass um, fluctuation that you see, do you know exactly where it is fluctuating at in the body? So when you see it on, on the time scale of a few days, it's usually fat mass. Lean mass is just okay. slower. Okay. And we also, we have um, body composition analyzers, so we can actually scan the mice. And we can, pretty pretty certain that on the scale of two to three days, it's almost always fat mass. Mm. Have you ever done anything longer term, played with that, done starvation experiments, things to see what, what would happen? Particularly what I'm wondering about, can you ever see, would you ever see anything happening in the pancreas itself? That's such a great question. We have done experiments up to six weeks in duration, and you do see changes in, in body weight. Usually the mice gain weight. I mean, mice are, these are young mice, they're already growing that right. phase of life. So they, they gain weight over that period. Um, but, and so at that point, over six weeks, you can gain both lean mass and fat mass. But I don't know that we can really see changes in the pancreas. The continuous glucose monitoring, we're just doing our first experiments and, you know, regulation of blood glucose happens so quickly. And no matter yeah. what we throw at these mice, you know, high fat diet, chow diet, um, exercise, fasting, um, young healthy mice are really good at monitoring, at managing their blood glucose. So we really have to push them pretty hard to get hyperglycemia. 
Um, we have a question here from uh, Magdalena. Do you want to, I will ask her to unmute. Hi, um, I have a question um, just about how insulin fits into this equation of energy balance equals food in minus energy out, especially I'm wondering about type one diabetes. If you don't have yet exogenous insulin being injected and you have decreased level of insulin, therefore I would imagine that you basically are not producing as much energy. Is that what we would expect to see? That's right. So you're probably not extracting as much energy from your food because insulin is anabolic. So what you see when you, you know, if you look at type one diabetics who are uncontrolled is you can see weight loss, right? As the body becomes catabolic and starts to use its own um, muscle as fuel. So you can see weight loss, you can see energy expenditure. So the, the energy expenditure actually increases as the animal uses its own body or the person uses its own body for, for fuel. However, in a fasting state, the body adapts by reducing its metabolic rate. That's why, you know, weight loss diets rarely work because the body slows its own metabolic rate. So I think it's going to depend on how long you have low insulin levels, whether it's chronic or just acute. Which model were you thinking about? Um, not any model in particular, but I was also thinking about um, when you showed previously, you know, the different chambers like humans can be, you know, you can measure their um, oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. For type one diabetes patients, for instance, would you be able to tell if they still have, let's say some kind of amount of pancreatic beta cells that are still producing? Would you be able to measure that out based on carbon dioxide out, oxygen in? So I'd say there are likely better ways to do it see peptide, for instance, mm -hmm. but, but just using this method, I'd say the best way to interpret this data is that, that RAR, the respiratory exchange ratio. So when the animal or person eats a carbohydrate based meal to digest the carbohydrate, the RAR goes up. But if you're not able to digest and oxidize the carbohydrate, the RAR goes down. So that's indicative of a fatty acid oxidation. So mm -hmm. I'd say if you have low levels of insulin, the RER value would be low. And it's RER is just the ratio of CO2 production to oxygen consumption. So I think you would be able to see that in this data. Okay, thank you. Sure. And I have a question with Heather. Um, Heather, can you unmute yourself? Um, yes. Um, I had a question regarding um, some of the early slides. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, um, showing the increased height and weight for humans um, for type 1D versus controls. I was just wondering if there are any factors, particularly for, for girls, um, looked at like in terms of precocious puberty having um, any impact on those observations. I really can't answer that. That's, that's beyond my expertise. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Heather. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Last call, call for questions. All right, I will uh, offer um, you guys to reach out or go back to your teams, uh, disseminate the information and reach out to um, Dr. Cadiz or um, Dr. Banks uh, as needed. And I believe they're both gonna be joining us uh, on the Slack channel uh, or you can reach out to them by, by email. Thank you both again for joining us, taking time out of your busy days and um, very much appreciate uh, all your contribution.